You're listening to 91.7 FM, WSUW, in Whitewater, Wisconsin. You're listening to Rashkin Report. You're listening to WSUW 91.7 FM in Whitewater, Wisconsin. This is Rashkin Report, and I'm your host, Yuri Rashkin. I'm excited to welcome back to the program Maria Snigavaya, a Russia expert. Afternoon. Yes, welcome back. Let's see what has uh, been happening. The situation is uh, developing constantly. We're looking at the uh, um, United States uh, that's uh, been in an amazing upheaval. And every time we check in, I kind of want to feel like I feel like saying, "Is is the world still there? Are we are we still? Is, is everything still okay?" Um, how concerned are you about the global picture? You are, uh, you know, you're living in New York. You're traveling to Russia back and forth. You have your communications. Um, how concerned are you about, uh, war, you know, the situation of relation between the United States and Russia at this point? Well, I guess uh, as unfortunate as the dynamics is, it's not, uh, it's not, it shouldn't be taken us by surprise, right? Because the whole developments have been there for a while and they're largely a Russian undertaking. So if Russia is facing some unfortunate consequences as a result of these dynamics, it's Russia's own doing to a large extent. So essentially what we observe is that uh, there is evidence uh, that Russia has interfered in the U.S. election uh, in 2016, and, and it did try to help its preferred candidate, Donald Trump who, in response, as we now already know, has been also trying to, uh, quote-unquote, improve the relationship with Russia by, for example, pushing the abolition, uh, the uh, um, lift of the sanctions on Russia introduced in the aftermath of the Ukrainian crisis, right? Uh, there is several uh, publications recently discussing how, at the very beginning of his presidency, Trump attempted to lift the sanctions. We also know that uh, the new round of the sanctions that have just been introduced by the Congress. Uh, there's also been a, a push uh, from the White House trying to lift those and, again, to improve uh, uh, these uh, conditions on uh, imposed on Russia. So, essentially, uh, the public in the United States is rightly concerned about these dynamics and whether there is a collusion between the, this president uh, of the United States and the Russia and the Kremlin. And so there's an investigation ongoing. Uh, essentially, we are witnessing the, um, uh, the logical uh, continuation of what has been there already for a while. And if anything, I think the U.S. public should be happy about that because we do observe the resistance of the U.S. democratic institutions that are pushing and trying to, you know, make clear, uh, bring to light whatever shady, you know, schemes may have been taking place between the White House and the Kremlin. Do you feel that these days uh, Mr. Putin is happy um, with what's going on in the White House or does he maybe think that this is too much? It seems like Secretary Tillerson has been almost the voice of reason these days and uh, to, my, to my, I guess in my opinion, he is very closely tied in with Kremlin. So is Putin even happy with how Trump is behaving? Well, uh, I th I think that Putin, because let's give let's give him credit. I think he's a relatively smart guy. You don't just stay in power, you know, for so many years. Well, one can even say indefinitely, uh, without being um, uh, relatively smart and intelligent. He understands that uh, Trump administration is currently in so-called trap, shall we say, that there is so much smoke uh, connecting uh, the behavior of the, the uh, Trump. Uh, himself and his clo uh, closest allies, associates, including his own, um, actually, son-in-law, uh, Jed Kushner, to Russia, that he is really limited in his capacity to do something in order to, you know, boost the relationship with Russia and with Vladimir Putin, uh, respectively. I think this is really understood well in the Kremlin, and uh, essentially we do see quite a moderate response uh, on the Russian side to, the, for example, the recent uh, extension of the sanctions that have just been uh, imposed uh, by the Congress. Uh, the Kremlin has been, again, remarkably silent or remarkably not hawkish on this issue. Uh, we also observed the same dynamics in December, back when the Obama administration imposed the last round of mm -hmm. sanctions. So the Kremlin uh, seems to realize that that uh, the tides, uh, some sort that the hands of uh, uh, 
essentially that the White House is not free in its behavior towards Russia. And I think that essentially they are waiting. They're waiting for the whole situation to come to some kind of resolution. Because uh, what can happen is that the investigation against, uh, regarding the, uh, uh, the collusion with Russia may actually be terminated for the lack of evidence, for example. And in that case, that will certainly facilitate to Trump further improvement of the relationship with Russia. I think that's a calculus. In that case, how do you feel about the latest sanctions, that are the, the bill that have been passed by the United States Senate but has not been yet passed by the lower, uh, you know, by Congress, by House of Representatives, mm -hmm. and certainly has not been signed by the President, uh, but yet the Senate passed it 97 to 2. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I think it's a great uh, development, and I think this is uh, it's understood by uh, the senators that uh, essentially, the White House should, uh, again, he, its ability to, uh, its discretion towards Russia should be limited. And I think uh, if uh, it was to be, become ultimately the law, it would be a good development uh, on the U.S. side, because that would essentially freeze the sanctions. There is a little new in that, uh, in that bill, except that, uh, except for the fact that uh, uh, the again the discretion the discretion of the executive branch uh, is limited in this case. So uh, I think uh, it's actually very like the, it's not a, a sensation in itself, but it's the right development because we know that the majority of the sanctions against Russia are imposed in the aftermath of the Ukrainian crisis are, have been imposed by uh, the executive decrees, and otherwise it would have been really easy for uh, to Trump to abolish those sanctions or any I guess present. Uh, for that matter, for that uh, reason. So in this sense, it's good because uh, the legislative branch potentially will make sure that those sanctions stay, stay in place. No matter what the president wants to do. Exactly. Now, in the, in the same time, as we're dealing with uh, the conflict over here, there is a protest movement that is gathering steam back in Russia. Uh, do you, uh, what, is, what is your take on it? Obviously, uh, because we are uh, so busy with looking at Trump and Russia, um, even though there is actual news going on in Russia, that doesn't seem to you know, penetrate so much anymore, except for maybe like a news uh, ticker that will announce that there is something going on. Um, to me, it seems like the, the developments in Russia are actually extremely influential and important to us here, because if, uh, for whatever reason, Putin's regime is over in Kremlin, that could help us here dealing with Trump. Um, what, what are your thoughts about the influence of Russian protest movement on, on what's going on here and the future of the relations? Um, yeah, interesting points, uh, Yuri. I actually just uh, published an article regarding that issue at the National Interest. Uh, I'm quite optimistic in general, in long term, let's put it this way. I certainly do not expect the Putin regime to collapse anytime soon, but, in, but essentially the development is really good for Russia because uh, what is new about these protests, and let us remind the audience that um, this is the second wave of the protests. Uh, the first one took place in 2011-2012. Uh, and uh, at the time it was labeled as the white collar protest because the middle class professionals in the uh, big cities essentially gathered to uh, protest the uh, authoritarian dynamics trends in the country. Uh, the new development this time is that uh, we uh, do observe uh, many more younger uh, Russians, uh, aged 18 and o older, 18 to 25 years old, taking, uh, taking part in this protest, which means that the new generation is not as brainwashed. And the larger explanation is that these guys take their, receive their news from Internet, uh, not from the state TV channels, unlike the older generations of the Russians. And so they're less, uh, less susceptible to the Kremlin propaganda. So in this sense, in the long term, that means that there is new generation in Russia emerging uh, that is not happy about where Putin is taking the country. And so in the long term, we will certainly see some alternation in the political system. Uh, on the on the darker side, unfortunately, I do not I do not think this is going to fundamentally change the dynamics in the short term. It's, I don't think that uh, we're going to see Navalny, the, who is the leader of the protest, replacing Putin uh, in the in this in the short term. And of course, the second uh, youth think about this protest, so the first being the youth actively taking part in the protest. Uh, the second thing uh, that is important is that this protest is really across regional in its nature. There is over 187 cities and towns take, uh, that took 
part in the province on June 12th. The same uh, happened on March 26th. In general, over 80,000 people all over Russia, according to different estimates. So this means that, again, uh, the protest is spread in a way, so it's not limited uh, into, to Russia's big capitals alone, or big cities alone, and it's spread all over the country. So does in it, the future, you can... Mm -hmm. Does it mean that Russian people are disappointed in Mr. Putin? Does it mean that they don't think that he is a good leader anymore? They, they, I thought they loved him, bare, you know, bare back on a horse, <laughs> you know, everything like that, but... Uh, has something changed? Are young people looking for different role models, or, or what? Yeah, I guess you know, uh, seeing the horses. same the same bear chest, chest on the same horses can be tiresome uh, after several, like after 17 years straight. Uh, yeah, uh, sociologically, actually, this is a continuation of the same dynamics that took place uh, already in 2011, 2012. Uh, the regime fundamentally has taken the country into the economic stagnation. Uh, because the further economic development is impossible without the reforms, and the re economic reforms would mean uh, disruption of the established corruption schemes, and uh, essentially that would uh, undermine the basic support base of Putin's. So that means that he will not impose those reforms, and uh, essentially it means that the stagnation will continue. And this already was taking place, this, this development has already uh, started in 2011, 2012, has been temporarily uh, suspended uh, because of the uh, Ukrainian war, uh, where Putin has been able to rally the nation around the flags uh, temporarily uh, after he annexed Crimea, and essentially the whole country celebrated that uh, uh, victory, quote unquote. But uh, the whole, uh, nonetheless, the whole long term dynamics remain the same, and we see the same frustration accumulating and once again uh, spreading all over the country. The important thing is that it's becoming broader in its nature, because it's spreading all over different regions that didn't used to be as involved in the protests before. So in this sense, it's what we observe is a long-term um, you know, expansion of the protest across all of the country. Uh, but to uh, actually refer back to your question regarding how this is going to influence uh, uh, the Russia-US relationship, which is an interesting question. I think that for generally pro-democratic uh, presidents, uh, this will uh, be good news because it will allow them uh, from the re rhetorically in the, in the discourse and also in the action to be able to constrain uh, certain actions by the Russian authorities because now they have the reasons, you know, to argue that look, guys, what you're doing, this is completely anti-democratic, you have a violation of human rights. And so this is just another reason to, you know, support uh, pro-democratic movements in the country and limit the discretion of the Russian authorities on the global stage for them, right, for, for the, the U.S. For the, for, the right, for the right U.S. president. Yeah, because... but not, yeah, unfortunately, yeah, not for a particular type of the U.S. president, shall we right. say. <laughs> who, who still considers human rights to be an important part of the mix. Yeah, and democracy, yeah. In democracy. Um, I think one of the reasons that uh, Putin has stayed in power is that he's been effective in convincing people that alternative to him would be worse. Um, there is an alternative, but if there were, well, that, that's, even, that's nationalists or that's uh, who knows what, what kind of direction they could take the country in. Um, are you concerned that uh, through these protests, there are stuff I think are growing. I mean, there was one on 26th of March that uh, got some notice, and then uh, recently there was a you know, much bigger one just a few days ago. They, they seem to be uh, growing. Um, one of the reasons that Putin even came back to power after he was the, the, the switch with his prime minister, but then came back, uh, supposedly had something to do with Arab Spring and his concerns about whether the instability could spread into Russia. What is your view, kind of a global view? Do you feel that these protests could lead to Russia being more destabilized? and becoming potentially more dangerous, and therefore it makes sense to almost support Putin because he is maybe, he's like Gaddafi, but he is, you know, or uh, Saddam Hussein, or, you know, he's one of those guys, but at least the country's holding together versus an alternative. Uh, that's an excellent question. You're very interesting, especially from my political science perspective. Um, I do think that each case, each country case should be regarded separately. Uh, and it is true, in fact, that Arab Spring, uh, essentially, to, to large extent, has to do with the spread of the new technologies that facilitate the collective action, the organization of the position, and which means they do destabilize, uh, they, they, uh, the they make... The technologies. Exactly. They okay. make uh, it easier for the protest movement to, to organize and to challenge the, the leader, the dictator. Mm -hmm. However, uh, uh, 
if the but where the democratization actually happens, uh, if you read the theories on that, uh, they're quite uh, well proven uh, by now. Democratization and democracy actually be begins to be st establish itself when certain structural preconditions are already set in place. That means certain level of income, certain expectation and democratic attitudes, civic attitudes have been shaped and formed within the population. So getting rid of one dictator uh, alone is not enough because the ne next one is going to come if the society is not ready. To, for democracy. This is exactly what we observed in most of the Arab Spring countries. It's exactly what we observed. Uh, even worse, given the Islam radicalization right now in the region, in many cases you replace one dictator with uh, which might be actually a theocratic or some kind of uh, radicalized regime, which, which might be potentially even more dangerous for the world than uh, the previous system. However, the Russia's situation is different because here I would argue the preconditions, the fundamental preconditions for democracy are in place. And we don't have that radicalized uh, uh, version uh, of religion that, first of all, will be conducive to uh, emergence of this uh, kind of scary uh, regime. Uh, the Russian uh, society is also not mobilized, it's largely passive, so you don't have that many. Uh, you know, uh, young people in the population. So I mentioned that they participate in the protests, but essentially uh, Russian society is getting older. That's not enough. Uh, demographically, there's not enough young people. That means that essentially it's more stabilized. Uh, um, that means that, again, the radicalization of the population is unlikely. Uh, in Economically, Russia has a sub substantive uh, per capita uh, income, which again means that uh, um, certain, the middle class is emerging, so that means that their social foundation for stable democracy is shaping there. Uh, and ultimately, right now, actually, we observe the formation of this uh, civic and democratic attitudes among the population. It's spreading. It's, of course, it's ongoing. It's not nowhere near completion as yet. But we do see that the democratic stands uh, start to emerge. Uh, Civic activity is quite developing really fast. If you look at the volunteering activity uh, among the Russian population, this is spreading at the increasingly high uh, uh, pace. Uh, right now, we see particularly younger population, but also like middle class, uh, middle aged professionals. They are more and more engaged in volunteering activities and donation and charity. All that is uh, that means that they are becoming, you know, active participants of their life. And essentially, that means that eventually they will also become active participants of the political system as well. So what this means is that I think that I, I like um, most um, uh, countries that uh, participated in the Arab Spring, which are predominantly poor, with very large young, young poor demographics and radicalized religion. Uh, um, Unlike the, those countries, Russia has many more preconditions for stable democracy. And we do observe, actually, Russia is much richer than many countries of Eastern Europe, uh, which democratized in, in the aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet system. And, you know, for better or worse, but they develop in the, you know, in the direction of the Western countries. Essentially, many of them are joining uh, the European Union and essentially becoming more or less established democracies with their own problems. I'm not saying they're ideal, uh, but they're moving in that direction. Is In Russia, I don't think it's fundamentally different uh, in that sense. If anything, it's richer. That means it's larger uh, middle class base. So, of course, there's many... It's, it's a very difficult question to answer, you know, in just uh, five minutes. And, of course, there are problems on the Russian side. One can argue that the middle class is not really... The professional middle class, a lot of those uh, people, uh, for example, belong to bureaucracy, state dependent bureaucracy or even security services, uh, which is different, different in essence, in its nature. But fundamentally, I think the preconditions are there. Fundamentally, I don't see the reasons why uh, replacing Putin with another leader would be um, somehow catastrophic for the country. Uh, if anything, in the 1990s, we observed that Russia, you know, had been developing again not without problems and shortcomings. But if anything, at the time, it was less dangerous for, for the world than it is under President Putin, less destabilizing for the world. All right. Let me ask you then, uh, the, perhaps our final question is, um, continuing with, uh, with this thought, um, as you were describing the Russian society, I couldn't help but think about Iraq under Saddam Hussein, which I think was viewed as a very stable country with passive population that was fairly educated, and they and they were going to be like we're going to chop off Saddam, we're going to put somebody else in, and it's going to be fine. 
and clearly i think one of the big mistakes was the um or you know was the fact that the solution came kind of from the outside and yet when you you know and so maybe if it was from the inside and the people rebelled or something happened maybe you know iraq wouldn't be in the, in the situation that it is right now with russia the putin's regime seems to be so solidly in there that there is a consensus that either has to some kind of miracle occur like the black swan event or, or something or uh, the solution has to come from the outside through you know either forces or soft power or something how do you view that balance as a political scientist between trying to improve the situation using the resources on the inside and how legitimate such change is going to be versus when it comes influence from outside well uh, i just don't think you know in the russian case we can seriously talk about some outside influence that can fundamentally destabilize the system i don't think the united states really are planning to invade russia unlike vladimir putin <laughs> shall we say i don't think the united states are planning to uh, invade russia anytime soon and that's un actually and if anything uh, one can argue this is not such a good development for the country uh, not such a good prospect for russia because uh, mm. uh, it is true uh, that according to some analysts for example andrei ilarionov used to make this point that uh, uh, countries with strong totalitarian legacy, totalitarian past, uh, very few of them, or almost no historical example, are when those countries have been able to democratize on, by themselves, on their own, like the Nazi, the Japan, the Nazi Germany Japan, and Japan, they needed for example. from the outside to come into Yeah, to that push matter. them in their direction. This is, in this sense, you're right, It's uh, uh, this is a problem. However, uh, again, uh, Russia right now is not authoritarian, it's an authoritarian system, and we do have multiple examples of authoritarian systems democratizing. It's just that in our case, this is going to be more, 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 much more complicated, given again the history and legacy and things like this, but the structural factors are there. Unlike, uh, once again, what we have observed in Iraq, Iraq, where, uh, first of all, it's a really divided religiously and ethnically, seriously divided society to a much larger extent than Russia is. And uh, Saddam Hussein has been a brutal and vicious dictator, and but he's been able to keep the country together. His viciousness to, a large, to some extent could be explained by the ethnic and religious diversity of the country. So they essentially it was real hard to make it, to put it together, that you needed some extra viciousness to, to make it work. Uh, and of course, this is an, uh, I think this is a mistake by uh, the Bush presidency that they underestimated this, uh, these problems when they went there. And so again, this what is, is your best mm -hmm. case scenario then for Russia at this point? Uh, what can we compare to? Uh, so well, right now, no, what, uh, are you, what are you hoping for will develop there to? Yeah, well. I, uh, yeah. A lot of uh, actually uh, 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 recent publications compare Russia's democratization, possible prospective democratization, to the developments we have observed in Eastern Europe, Polish, uh, for example. Uh, some uh, compare it to, to the Baltic cases, and the Valens as such. Uh, Valencia, some people compare him to Paulus Valencia, the populist leader who's able mm -hmm. to unite uh, different groups of the Russian society on, let's be honest, uh, kind of a populist agenda. But again, this we need to be really kind of um, specific about defining what we mean by populism here. In the Valencia's case, it just means that he has broader, broader kind of issues that are He's using this agenda that uh, connects broader issues, being able to unite the country. For example, everybody agrees that corruption is bad. So he's using this anti-corruption platform because everybody is pretty confident this is bad and uh, one needs to fight against it. Uh, so then this says it's populist. It doesn't mean that it's, it's bad. It's just, it's political. So do you feel that Navalny is a future solution then, or one possible solution? I think that so far, of all of the political leaders, democratic political leaders that we observed uh, in Russia, he's the most successful one, given particularly given how difficult the conditions are in which he survives. So I think uh, he's a really courageous uh, man, and most people agree he's a so-called political animal. He feels where the political opportunity is, and he uses it. Uh, for example, when he um, announced his um, participation in the 2018 presidential election in December 2016, Everybody, most political analysts have been skeptical about that because Russia, again, the political landscape in Russia at the time felt like complete stagnation and everybody was confident Putin was going to win in 2018. And, and that's just really six, seven months ago. Exactly. 
And in all just half a year, he completely changed the whole the, dyna- the political dynamics in this huge country. Right now, the, as we have just discussed, 187 cities protesting, over about 100,000 people taking part in the protests, uh, and uh, plenty of younger people, Navalny's everywhere. Even the state TV channels started slowly mentioning his name. So uh, he's been able to impose his agenda on uh, on such a huge country and on the Kremlin as well. This is a big achievement. So I don't necessarily say that he's uh, going to be. Um, so I'm confident he's going to be the one to you know, replace Putin or get rid of Putin. But Navalny is certainly the most successful political leader in the country right now, and he's certainly pushing the country in the right direction. He's you know the making us wake up. And this is a really big achievement. Where is Nikava, a news analyst, published everywhere that I enjoy <laughs> reading. Thank you so much for being once again on Rashkin Report. Thank you. Thank you. You're listening to 91.7 FM, WSUW, in Whitewater, Wisconsin. listening to Rashkin Report.